The 1v1 interview series is a production of the Boss Rush Network of Podcasts. Visit bossrush.net to listen to our podcast and read our articles, game reviews, and more. You can also follow us on Twitter at Boss Rush Network to stay up to date with our content. Thank you for listening. Hello, everybody. Welcome to 1v1 here on Boss Rush Games. I'm your host, the one, the only, and the light and excited Eddie V. Joining me, finally, we get the touchdown. My best friend, my bro, him. I I started with him way back in the day, probably about, what, five? five? It's, it's going to be six years in March. Oh, good, Googly Movie. Six years uh, like starting this this network and this podcast with them um you know he's he's literally my best friend my bro him like y'all just don't know when i get to interact when i get to see him when i get to sit by him man i just i get to crack up i get to literally be serious with them at times but just like we We've been kind of friends for a really long time, um, you know. And we, and it's funny because we actually met through Facebook, do I think Nintendo voice chat, mm-hmm. um, you know. And we're gonna get more into it. Everybody, please welcome. I, I, I guess the boss or head chief of World War World One One. World One One Network. I should just really say, not just the podcast network. Please, everybody, welcome Larry Giver. Hello. Easy way to keep straight how long it's been. Remember how old Olivia is, because she was born three weeks after you and I started the show. Yes, that is true. Um, episode four, I was gone because I was in the delivery room. Yes. Um. So let everybody know uh, the original cast. Uh, original founders, I should say, was Larry, um, our good friend Adrian Nieto, and Tony Zilakakis. Uh, we were, um, you know, we, we're, and we're still friends and everything. We started World One One podcast because we was doing Nintendo Book Club, uh, you know, and we was playing Nintendo games, and Adrian was hosted that, and we just kept talking, interacting. This is back in the fa- when before Facebook became what it is today. You it know, was it, you, me, Adrian, and Tony, uh, and I think it was the November before we started World One One. We did a NVC book club episode together on Metroid Prime, is what it was. Yes. And so, you know, we just kept talking and, you know, we had other people also that we interacted in Nintendo Book Club and Nintendo Voice Chat. And literally it just expanded from there. Um, You know, people will be here and there uh, and everything. But before we get all into that, Larry, how are you? (laughs) Still waking up, but I'm all right. I'm surviving. That's good. That's very good. Uh, we're going to start this discussion about how did you actually get into video games? Oh, uh, let's see. <sighs> had had friends when I was a kid that, you know, it just it was something that just always drew to me. And, you know, I had friends that had video games. Uh, so, you know, we'd go over and hang out and play video games when I was a kid. And then it's like, yeah, no, I, I'd like to have this at my house, please, because I grew up in a neighborhood with without really any kids in it. And mm-hmm. so a lot of my childhood was finding ways to entertain myself. So things you could do without anybody else around books, TV, movie, Legos, video games and uh I, I will say it was probably very formative in my taste in video games because I'm not one for multiplayer much of anything. Mm. And so, you know, single player, something with a, a a deep, engaging, well-written story or something with a really unique or interesting hook. But 
multiplayer was never a a draw for me because I'm like, yeah, this was never my thing because I never had anybody to play with. This was something for me to entertain myself with. Yeah, a, a lot of the multiplayer games, like way back in the day, um, were co-op, but it was only like a few. Like, you know, Tecmo Ball, of course, because it's a sports game, or Double Dribble. But, like, one of the most well-known co-op games was Contra, in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, because of its run-and-gun nature, and that two characters are both on screen. Mostly with some co-op games, you have to take turns. Like, the first player will go first, and then if you die, it's the second player. Even Nintendo did that with until like Super Mario Brothers three, mm -hmm. or even to, well, even Super Mario, even Super Mario World, like you didn't actually yeah. get more people on screen until New Super Mario Brothers. In At least for that series, but yeah, I mean that's not to say that they weren't doing other things where you're playing with multiple people together. Well, on a, a the screen at the same time, right? Like Mar of course, Mario Kart and you know, uh, Mario Party and stuff, uh, you know, some of the side games in the Mario series. But, like, playing in a platform sense, uh, you were, you really didn't get that until, in my opinion, New Super Mario Bros. Wii and stuff. Maybe. I feel like Donkey Kong might have. No, Donkey Kong gets switched. Oh, that's right. That's right. It's been a while since I've cracked that open. Yeah, because I I literally don't like Duck Hunt would do it, but it it like Duck Hunt didn't or anything. Well, Duck Hunt technically had a two player. Yes, it did. So, but it but it it's wasn't not like anybody's time. character. Well, no, in two player, there's only one character on the screen, the duck. The yes. main player isn't even on the screen. Yes, that is true. It was you, the gun, the, and the sound effect. <laughs> mm hmm So, um, I now, need a duck hunt, too, where I can finally play as the dog. Oh, good googly moogly. Are we ready for that one? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'm just saying, I'm a little surprised they never did a duck hunt, too, on the Wii. That is true. I That's think... a weird one to skip. They totally should have done a brand new duck hunt on the Wii. It's. I think Duck Hunt is such a packing game. They would just. They would have been like, "How do we make this as a full game?" Because you know, of course, with Link with the Legend of Zelda, uh, they were able to do it because of the bow. But I'm just like, how do you do Duck Hunt without getting Peter to like? make some kind of fake game and make a fun of Nintendo or offending what PETA does. PETA can get bad. Which is weird. And I never understood why PETA will always pick on Nintendo with this games, but never like the hunting games that like, because it's bigger. Like even like with Sega's fishing games, they like, they mm -hmm. never picked on anything where you, your main game, your main goal is to hunt animals and hurt them. Because bigger target gets you a bigger audience. It's very interesting. Just very interesting. Well, let's jump into how World One One podcast start. Uh, how did the idea come up? Well, the the original iteration from long ago now was, you know. You, me, Eddie, or you, me, Tony, and Adrian, because, you know, we got together for that episode of NBC Book Club, and I really had a good time, and I'm like, you know what, I feel like we all gelled well together, we should totally mm -hmm. do some more of this, and so I, I dug you all up on Facebook, stuck you all in a group on Messenger, and was like, hey, I got an idea, you want to do more of this? I poked at it for uh, a month or two. We finally got it off the ground and started moving, and it it started mostly just kind of aimless video game chatter with, uh, you know, more for us, I think it was, just to enjoy getting to have, you know, a, a couple of people to 
chew the fat with and mm-hmm. talk video games on a weekly basis and it's it's grown and changed and evolved from there obviously but that's that's kind of where it started okay yeah uh because i just i i came off of that episode of nvc book club and i'm like you know that was a lot of fun and it, it felt like the conversation just jived really well yeah and when we were doing it we kind of we didn't have the technology that we have now in a sense it was just like i was recording it um i was sending you the file you know we were still recording through skype and you know it was a ramshackle operation yes it was skype didn't have its built-in recording option at that point we had to wait years for that to come along oh yes so we uh we literally had to make do um for anybody who don't know, I kind of had to use two computers at the time uh-huh. to record it and everything. But um, I did Audio Magic. We got to record it, and you know, we we figured things out. We was uploading it and getting it out, and we actually had some good flow to it because it would be like what we uh, was some back in the day. Yeah, what we've been playing. Um, you know, pitching ideas for games and stuff. Uh, of course, we would talk news, but we will also have like a topic. So we we had formats to the show, but uh, it was it had, very loosely defined. <laughs> yes, we <laughs> we ended up uh coming up with our motto: "We are professionally um prof- uh, professional, a train wreck of uh." Train wreck of professionalism and track of adulting. Yes. Because there would be times that we would get serious and Larry would bust out with a joke and we would crack up or we were grown. We we were grown sometimes, but it would be so off rails and so funny because we were having fun. We we were literally young podcasters. You know, we have never did anything like this and it took us time to get to where we was at you know and and that change did happen fairly organically like we started just kind of it naturally shifted and kind of fell into place little by little almost mm -hmm. on its own really yeah and i when you know as time went uh and like tony and adrian uh stepped down due to life reasons uh mm-hmm. still love those guys um, busy doing their thing right uh we was carrying the torch and you know i got busy and you know we got new uh people and stuff um during that time it was when, when it was just me and you doing a doing a, a two-person podcast we actually got to meet a lot of creators and it, because oh, yeah. of you reaching out like we was able to talk to Pierre Schneider and I wish I could I wish I had everything better at that time to introduce to talk to him because that one was a really good talk but it like, was it if you go back that one was tragically riddled with uh audio issues because of connection problems yeah more than anything but uh and I, I still think one of our biggest discussions I still feel like uh, talking to Yacht Club. Mm-hmm. And Yacht Club was good. And I, I feel like that kind of was our top interview um, with it. Uh, because we not only talked about uh, uh, Shovel Knight, you know, we actually felt like, it, it's, in all honesty, it really felt like we all knew each other for years and that we played video games, definitely on the NES, in the same neighborhood. Because it was just amazing to talk to them and everything. And, well, I want to ask you, what was your, what has been your biggest conversation that you took away from interviewing? Like, which one was you, you felt like? your favorite. Yes. Oh, favorite interview. I, I'll give it a. Mm, 
It's got to be Milton and Steve, but I will say yes. Jonathan Holmes is a really, really tight second. He is amazing. So, like, Holmes is just right behind, but uh, Milton and Steve, for me, for personal preference reasons, and then on top of that, too, you know, they are one of the only ones that have actually become recurring on our shows. Mm -hmm. So, because we've had them, we've had them on together a couple of times and separately uh, once or twice. Yeah, for different, and, different things. And I and I feel like talking to Milton, you know. Just the way that he creates and he designs and he has his passion for um, adventure games that's like in the rim of Metroidvania, if you want to put it that way. Um, just seeing how him and Steve did AM2R to now doing Ori in the Blind Forest. For both No, games. he wasn't on Blind Forest. He was I mean, on uh, uh, Will of the Wisps. Will, Will of the Wisps. But you know, joining us with Moon Studio to help make that game, it's it literally was amazing. Cause I think I even congratulated him on like, you know, yes, and you're at Moon Studios, you're achieving your dream. I'm like, you this this fan project that you did led you to actually be with a studio to make an actual game, you know. And that's amazing. Like now you are to me certif a certified developer. Not saying that he wasn't de a developer when he made AM to yeah. but I'm like, you are literally a certified developer. And it's so great to know professional that, in the business sense. Yes. That good things has cunt has came. Mm -hmm. In a sense. And even now I don't know what Steve has been up to because I haven't got to talk to him, but I like, still talk to Steve actually uh, semi regularly, but you know he's a great person. Like he he was literally awesome. He's been doing some art stuff for us actually. Oh, that's awesome. He's the one that's uh, been working on the Phase On Labs uh, show logo. Mm -hmm. um, he also did the the new graphic for the network slogan. Okay. Well, I, I kind of want to ask you, how did you expand the World World One One Network? I should say. Well, that that kind of started. Oh, excuse me. It's still early. Um, that started because Michael and I used to uh, used to chat back and forth all the time. Because I've known Michael since I was in middle school. Mm. So we go oh. way the hell back. Before you go, Larry, uh, can you scoot up? Because it's only your eyes. <laughs> there oh, you go. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, fine. No, that's all you get. It's where we're doing this. Uh, uh, you don't know Jack style. <laughs> it's not going to be good for the video. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Find me Cookie Masterson now. But in any case, um, so Michael and I would regularly conversate and throw our, our Metroid ideas back and forth because we're both big, huge fans. And uh, I'm like, you know what? I, I feel like there there's a good deep well of content there that we that could be fun to play with just for the sake of doing something fun and creative. Mm -hmm. Someplace to, you know park these ideas and uh so i i got on and ended up uh crossing paths with isabel and she liked the idea and she jumped in and started phase on labs with me um i, I would have gone to michael straight away except i know his his work schedule is rough yeah uh, so it makes it a little tough to try and make those pieces line up but so you know, and this was early, early 2021. And then, you know, so we'd been playing with the idea and kind of getting it set up. 
and then E3 happened last year. <laughs> and what we thought was going to be literal evergreen content suddenly now had an expiration date on it. So I'm like, well, shit, I guess we better move on this now. So we, we launched uh, earlier than anticipated and earlier uh, and before I had a chance to kind of get all the pieces in place that I wanted to get in place uh, going into it. But it, it was very well and warmly received. Um, eventually, Isabel parted ways. She had a lot going on on her plate, both putting together uh, uh, the Metroid 35 zine and school and other things. And mm-hmm. So at that point, we uh, we did a passing of the torch and uh, brought Michael aboard and for that project. Um, and there were some others and, you know, some of it is on hold at the moment just because of things that we're working on kind of behind the scenes, trying to get some things realigned and straightened up and, mm. uh, find the, find the best route forward. Um, including the main show world one, one actually, but we're, I think we're getting closer to a solution. Um, just because as the crew has grown and everybody's lives, you know, change and things happen, it, you, you got to learn how to figure out how to move and evolve with those moving pieces. That's, that's a tough one to do, but it's doable as long as you're willing to put into it. And like I said, I think we're getting closer to getting that sorted so that we can bring the main show back online along with phase on labs and, Hard Copy Hounds is another one that's sitting on hold because uh, I was I was doing all the work front and back end on that myself, and that's a that's a massive undertaking to mm. get it to where it serves the purpose it's supposed to, and having that one and doing that one all on my own instead of having anybody to split the workload out with made that real tough. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to set this to the side for the moment until I can either figure out a better way to do it on my own, or I can get some help with that on the back end uh, to make that more manageable on a weekly basis. But uh, phase on labs is still, you know, happily chugging along. I have a ton of fun with that. Uh, And then our newest one, I'd play that for a dollar with, uh, Todd and Kathy and Chris has uh, been very well received. Actually, I, I've, I've gotten a handful of comments over the last couple of months that we got that started that have really enjoyed it. It's kind of nice to hear that feedback. Um, funny story, actually, the the genesis of that show started with just a a play on the on the RoboCop movie line, you know, I'd buy that for a dollar. And I'm like, I feel like there's an idea here and I'm not sure what it is yet, but I started playing with it in my head and I'm like, I'd play that for a dollar. And then I'm, I'm hearing, I'd play that for a dollar in my head in the voice of Fry from Futurama. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what would this be? And I, I started putting the idea together and it, it very quickly came into the idea that it is now. But the funny part was, I talked to LeGru about it because LeGru's kind of my right hand man, especially in the in the background. Um, he and I talk constantly and he's very much and very often a soundboard for my ideas. And he's like, I feel like there's there's a limited series potential there, but he's like, I don't think it could. And I'm like, you know, you and I are usually on the same page on this, but my gut says we can we can pull this off into a a great ongoing deep well format and uh, a couple weeks later he's like I'm really liking this this has turned out great he's like I was wrong you had the idea right <laughs> so um, but there's there's more in the cooker too uh, matter of fact actually one of the old show segments that we used to do way back in the early days yeah um is is kind of sitting in the wings there's there's actually a good handful of show ideas that are literally just sitting in a google doc somewhere waiting for the right people to come along to uh to pick them up and run with them because 
my plate is as full as it can be uh, with what I do and manage as far as the, the network and the shows go. But the thing is, there's a lot of killer ideas for expanding out, you know, further the, the content that we provide and that we put out there. But I no longer have the bandwidth to add any more to my plate. And so it's a matter of trying to find the right person to come along and, you know, match them up with the right idea and get them up and running with that. Um, that said, you know, we've got we just launched yesterday as a recording uh the newest show on the network zoe is doing mind over media which is a a look at media including movies tv music and video games and uh how they how certain pieces of those media tie to uh, and or emphasize on mental and emotional health uh first episode launched about gris which was absolutely fantastic and there's there's more in the works i know there's another couple that are uh queued up and ready to go so uh, a sneak preview there's one coming on lucifer uh there's another one on infinity train and i know some of the other stuff that she's working on in there as well i've i've seen that google doc uh for other ones that she wants to tackle is uh they go forward with that it's funny that you mentioned Gree. Um, we did we got a show called Talk the Walk on Boss Rush, and that was one of the games that uh, we talked about. Um, it was a show about walking simulators, and we at the time about Gree, I didn't know it was about grief. I thought it was just mm-hmm. like you know you lost this color, and you know from this world and because of the color being gone. Um, the statue that was holding you, like kind of almost your protector, you know, you know, kind of disappeared and stuff. So your journey was to get the get that color back. It didn't understand that it had all of this meaning because don't forget, Greek came wow, out. Wow, ten nowhere. out of ten, you missed the metaphor on that one. <laughs> because, but but think of, but when you think about it, the reason why I was thinking about it bringing back color. It's because that you start this world in a black and white manner. And don't forget, they never told you anything about Gree. They just literally do the trailer. Two or three weeks later, after the trailer came out, the game was on Nintendo Switch. And so you didn't have no you didn't have no idea that the game was about Gree, um, about grief. So when I when I first played it, and I love Gree. I st- still to this day, I even got on my YouTube page like the whole game, uh, a three hour um, recording of the whole game. When I played it, it left me speechless because I'm like, the music is beautiful, the level design is great. I love that when you progress, you're adding these colors, and these colors are kind of restoring the world. Like you don't have no idea of, of grief because you're also restoring that statue and everything. Um, and then when you get to the end of the game and you see the conclusion, you're just like, okay, I got it. Yay. I, I thought that I saved the world. Well, when I say the world, that I brought all the color back and everything is back to normal. So Speaking when of how we start that is next time you're here, remind me to get out the art book for you to check out. We watched. We looked at it. Oh, did we? Yeah. Oh, that's right. I couldn't remember if we had or hadn't. It's been a while. Yeah, and so that was kind of the thing about it was just looking, not seeing it from that perspective. So when we talked about it on Talk to Walk, we was talking about grief and you know the things that what the colors represent in the areas and stuff because if you don't have no idea about it you think it's this adventure slash not so much a metroidvania but this adventure game where you progress because you can you can really go back to areas like once you pass the area you and you was locked out of it that was it you if you want to go back to it you got to do I guess a chapter select after the game is over with and try to collect everything? Um, but it was just interesting to see that take with it, you know. Uh, oh, God, that's that's such a stunning game all the way through. 
Yeah, I, I still feel like Santa Monica should use that art style to tell a God of War game or do something new. I would love to see Santa Monica do that can draw. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to see them do uh, do God of War with that, but I could definitely see them doing something interesting. Yeah. So, um, now, everybody probably don't know what Phase On Last is. Phase On Last is a show about Metroid, and um, they explore the world of Metroid, uh, looking into games, some of the history, and like even creating ideas for what a Metroid game could be in the future. And that's everything. the biggest piece, honestly, is just doing the the pitch week over week is what it is. You know, I, I put out there that it's it's the internet's premier Metroid futurist podcast because that's what we're doing is you know looking at what the the future of the series might be in terms mm-hmm. of game ideas. And you know, some of them are ones that I could we we could easily see being legitimately feasible, and some of them are ones where it's just like I had this absolutely off the wall idea and it made me laugh. So if I have to live with it, you do too. Yeah. Oh, wow. like the Farmville I- episode. <laughs> Oh wow. <laughs> so. Oh wow. Which is funny because now thinking about Metroid and it becoming a big phenomenon. Like Nintendo got that money from the Wii U sales. Yeah, uh still zero mission. actual numbers Future. though, but I I think it's because it took them by surprise. Uh, they probably just don't record on old data in a sense like that. Um, you know, I mean, and like I me and you, we talked about Metro Dread and everything. I kind of want to ask you, do you feel like now Mercury Steam is the head developer on the Metro series? Uh, no. Uh, namely because you're you're talking almost two branches because yeah, Mercury Steam has done the last two side scrolling Metroid games, mm-hmm. but then you've also got Retro who's back in the saddle with the Prime series after that got scrapped and restarted on uh, Prime Four. Um, and you you for a long time could have very much considered Retro to be the one that was the the lead on the metroid franchise but really i think it's just i I don't know that i would put anybody front and center as this is the person or the studio responsible for it because that series has forked into two directions essentially Mm -hmm. with the mainline and the prime series and then hell you've got team ninja in the mix still from other m which is which is kind of weird because now Team Ninja is well not so much Team Ninja I won't say that uh, Kobe Tecmo has moved better into the Legend of Zelda franchise with uh, with the Warrior Gangs than what Team Ninja did with it because 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 to really tell you the truth like it was kind of un- it's unexpected that nintendo works with team uh works with kobe Tecmo, um because it kind of started with the wii uh some 3ds games uh but like on nintendo's properties it kind of started with the wii you know kobe Tecmo was kind of or Tecmo at the time was kind of just like this is the ninja guided and dead or alive company mm-hmm and then they got with Nintendo and like literally through everybody. That's kind of I think one of the biggest surprise about Nintendo working with Team Ninja to make a Metroid game. That was definitely not the route that I saw that going. Uh, you know, when I'm like, who would who would pick this and saw that I'm like, okay, that was not the name I expected, but but they uh, to me personally, I feel like they pulled they pulled it off. Um, because they were trying to move. I think they did some things well. Well, I think moving her to a uh, more action-packed pace 
giving it this style and everything, I think it was kind of like helping Kobe Tecmo or Team Ninja at the time, um, helping them better their action games because Nintendo is the only company at this time that I know of that have an exclusive game from Team Ninja and from Platinum Games. Because don't forget, uh, uh, besides outside of Ninja Theory, you know, Team it was mostly Team Ninja versus uh, Platinum Games mm-hmm. at the time. And now to see that Nintendo works with both of them in a sense, you know, like there's like really no beef or anything. It's 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 an interesting thing. I'm like, if you go back and you look at the games that they produce and some of the stuff that was said, you would kind of be amazed that Nintendo, with all the money that they have, they work with those companies to make better products. So regardless of what people think about uh, Metroid Other M, you kind of got to give it to Nintendo and Team Ninja coming together to make that game because it kind of made them a better developer after the Ninja Gaiden games. I, I could see that. I mean, there, there definitely had to have been some takeaways that they learned from doing it. Mm-hmm. So... I mean, granted, you got to get that with anybody and everybody, but I feel like that's a big one there for them. Right, because there's got to be someone at Nintendo that came in to be like, we're checking the quality and we're checking the polish of this game. Because me and you, we have talked about Metroid because it's one of your biggest series. It's like probably Mm -hmm. your number one video game series. Oh, it is. You know, we got a two-part episode about metroid you know talking about the games our time with it and now seeing like we even <laughs> literally we could have podcast about metroid dread which we have one on phase on laps we did uh, that yep but we like spoiler cast yes but when we <clears throat> when we went and when we seen the trailer for metroid dread I caught you like maybe what 40 minutes after that E3 presentation and I caught you from my car and we literally we literally could have podcast if we were oh, yeah. recording that conversation. We absolutely could have. You know, um because it was it was it was kind of it was kind of very interesting to see that. So, um I kind of want to ask you now, what do you see the future of World 1 1 podcast or World 1 1 network, I should say? Of the network? Um, I said there's, there's stuff that is just launching. There are some things that are just getting ready to start production. So there's more content coming. And I, I think it's it's going to start diversifying a little further in terms of content. I know Mm. that there are a couple of things that are either in the works or hopefully will be in the works in the near future that lean more towards flexing the creativity muscle um, instead of just analysis and deep dives and breakdowns which is you know one of the things that i i miss doing as well which is why i'm trying very hard to get uh the show world one one back on the rails again um there's there's some awesome topics that are sitting in the wings waiting for waiting for that to start that train to start rolling again um I'm really excited about some of the creative stuff. You know, uh, phase on labs is really just kind of the, the first in what's going to be a, a suite of creativity and, uh, pitch driven shows. Um, so that's, that's one that I'm really excited about. And, and one of those is actually, 
born from a segment that we used to do way the hell back in the day. Um, but I'm looking for the right person to fill the role of uh, running that ship. Um, there's some new scripted content that's in the works for the network. Um, I won't say a ton more on that, but one of our one of our folks is working on writing a a scripted uh, audio sitcom mm-hmm. that will air on World One One Network. So that's that'll be a, a new direction for us to dabble into. Uh, there's actually a improv comedy series that I'm still hoping to find the right person for that vision because you you've heard it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but if we can get the right person to execute on that vision, I think it'll be uh, hilarious and horrifying kinds of ways. <laughs> Um, but I, I would love to see that come together as well. But a lot of it is just really finding the right people for the, for the right material. And that's, that's the toughest thing, honestly, you, it's, it's not as easy as going, you know, putting up a post and go, who wants to make a podcast? It's there, there's a lot more to it than that, that makes building that future, uh, it makes it a, a lot of work and a lot of effort goes into it. But when it mm-hmm. finally comes together, the payoff is well worth. So. Yeah. I, I remember there was a time uh, before podcast was getting popular. There were so many popping up and now, you know, it's just like. Pandemic did a lot for that. Yeah, um, right now it's just like podcast is you know it's about now maintaining the podcast and you know adding new shows and doing limited series and stuff. Right now it's about maintaining um, with it and everything because uh, definitely with the way you know things are going on in the world, you kind of need something to listen to or something to help you get through these times. You know, there's not a new podcast popping up every week like it used to back in the day. Now it's just like if you could, we, we talked about it, if you could pass like four episodes and keep the momentum going, you you know the world of podcasting, being a podcaster. Yeah. You know, because it's not, it's just not about just getting a bunch of friends or people around the world and you guys talking. It's keeping that momentum and stuff, regardless of of schedules and stuff. It's keeping it going and stuff, and keeping it interesting. And sometimes you gotta reinvent and everything. Speaking of, uh, you know, where it's going and new shows popping up, you were remiss if I didn't mention too. We've got another new one that we'll be recording some test episodes this coming week, just to hammer out the details on it a little bit more, Mm -hmm. but. Uh, new show is coming about a something that all of us as gamers deal with our backlogs. Oh, that's easy. So, yeah, it's easy, but you know, the, the trick is, is a, as a content creator, you know, you've got to find a, a way to create a unique hook Mm -hmm. to, you know, stand out in that crowd too, though. And I, I think we've got the idea dialed in. We just gotta gotta get the routine and the format dialed in in execution. We actually we actually been talking about backlogs, um, just like people bringing it up around the, in the internet because it's a new year, and they're finally getting to games that they have for years or that they started and they stopped and. It, it kind of, it, it amazes me that, you know, and I'm guilty of this too, is that we create this backlog because we're still playing the familiar games and the games that bring us comfort and stuff. You know, you spend a year playing this one game, 
even though you could have been playing all of this other stuff. And I, I and I think that's why kind of when I look at it, it's just like definitely for my point of view, it's just like, man, I need to jump more into the games that I purchased and that I have and work through them and everything. Cause I I reward myself with like Yoshi coins. Like I I set myself up with a system to be like, if I beat this and I get through it, this is what I am warning myself. So at the end of the year, this is my final total that I that I can actually say that I got these games done. In yeah, and how'd you do on your backlog for 2021? So for 2021, I think I got through maybe seven or eight games that I got through for it. And, and it was because I was buying a lot of new games. Um in 2021 you know oh yeah and so uh, it was kind of just like being on the up and up but i got a lot that i need to go through because there's like game like I, I was talking about river city girls i had that on my switch for a while but it was just like let me sit down and play this all the way through you know because I've never beaten a Kunio game. I've played many of them, but I never beat them. And I was like, okay, now I understand why this game, that people love it, and why it takes time to get into it. Because it is a beat em up, but it's also a role playing game in a sense. Mm-hmm. You're you know? not wrong. It's. They, they definitely have their, their place in the annals of history. Right, it, it, there are some games that's that I have for a backlog that I haven't started yet, but I can't wait to get into. And some of them is just like I'm at the end end of the game. I just need to put it in and get through it. Agreed. You know, I I, I was thinking about it the other day, honestly, and I, I feel like one of the biggest reasons that we as gamers, you know, have have such a pile up of backlog is because. We we see these games, you know, announced and revealed, and we check out the trailers and the gameplay footage, and we go, that looks really good. That looks like a lot of fun. But then when it's in your hands, and the reality of starting a new game and learning all the stuff from the beginning again is right in front of you, it starts to feel like a daunting task, and you just go, mm-hmm. I could just go back and replay the game that I already know inside and out and not have to, because that... That that is a that is a hurdle to get over when trying to get yourself to get into a new game is finding one that not only are you in the right headspace for that you're going to connect with to keep you playing, but then also getting over that initial hurdle of man, I got to learn a bunch of new shit again just to enjoy this. Which which is good, and and I think that's like. When people say they uh, they don't have nothing to play, I always feel like you do have something to play. You just choose not to play it. Well, there's something to be said for, you know, admitting it's like, yeah, I'm just not in the right space or the, the right frame of mind today to learn a new game. Like, I want to play a game. I don't want to learn a new game. And, and, not right now. And I think that's why I'm trying to change to be like, you know what? I had this game for a while. Let me put it in and let me work through it and everything. Because, like, there's 2021 games that I started, got the idea of it, and then put away because I've been working on other games. So, like, me jumping around, I'm trying to do less of that and focus on and finish them. Yeah. You know, well, and you're you're gonna finish more games if you do less hopping around. But it's yes. Sometimes your brain's just not there, and you got to know when to cut cut your losses for the moment. Yeah, that is true. Well, Larry, uh, we're gonna wrap this discussion up. Um, is there anything else that you would like to promote or speak about when it comes to the World 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 One One Network? I know everybody that's hard to say, uh, uh, but um, anything that you would like to else say about World One One Network? So, two pieces. One, you know, make sure you're tuning in. We we very conveniently put all of our shows in one single easy to uh, find RSS feed. Uh, you can find us 
on all of your favorite podcatchers, you know, world11.podbean.com, all spelled out, all one word. You can also catch us, uh, you know, we're, we're big fans of good pods. We, we love if you're listening to us on good pods because it's, it's a better way to, for us to be able to interact with, you know, anybody that's listening. It's a chance for us to kind of get a, a peek at who's listening, which you don't really get with any other podcatcher service. So shout out to them for building an awesome platform. But, um, but the, the second one, aside from, you know, go, go hit us up and check out our stuff and go from there. But the second one is if you have any interest whatsoever in jumping into podcasting anywhere in the, in the video game world, get a hold of us. Cause like I said, there's literally an entire sheet of of show ideas that are literally just looking and waiting to be adopted by the right person um so that they can come into existence and be amazing with amazing people so you know if creativity is in your bones get out get a hold of us come talk to me we'll uh we'll put something together and we'll do some we'll do some cool stuff and we'll have some cool fun Okay. All right. Well, you guys can find me on Twitter at that retro code. Uh, you can check more of Boss Rush content at bossrush.net and on our YouTube page at Boss Rush Game, uh, Boss Rush Network. I'm sorry. Um, check our writing on bossrush.net. And also, everybody, if you would like to support us more, you can join our Patreon. Um, there's various tiers on there that you guys could join at and we see bonus content early in events. Um, and other things that could go benefits i should say that could go along with it with that everybody thank you larry for doing this one v one with me it's been so long that we podcast together and it's yeah always... we don't get to do this nearly enough anymore yes you yes. and your bloody work schedule uh, i know uh but uh everybody have a great week have a great weekend and we will see you next time on one v one Bye, everybody. Peace.